Welcome to episode one of Who Let the Dogma Out? Who Let the Dogma Out? Where doctrine has dominion over all of life. Um, yes, you probably chuckled at that name. I did too. The first time I heard it, we're going to tell you where that came from here in a little bit. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Jack Wilkie. I'm joined and very excited to, to get this new show going with Jacob Rutledge and Daniel Mayfield. Uh, I think the best way is just go around, tell us who you are. Uh, you know, I, as we talked about I, before we came on, Daniel has people who are going to listen, who know who he is, who are like, who on earth is Jack Wilkie or Jacob Rutledge and, and vice versa each way. And so um, Actually, nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> nobody uh, asks who you are because they all know who you are. That's exactly it. And if they <laughs> don't, they're going to from this show. Right. You know, just so, uh, you know, Daniel, go ahead. Lead us off. Uh. I'm, hey, what's going on? I'm Daniel Mayfield. Um, as I said, I, I do need to introduce myself because nobody knows who I am. A uh, very obscure individual. And those that do know me have already deleted me on, on social media. So um, I, uh, I am, I'm ministering in the grand metropolis of Kingfisher, Oklahoma, um, just northwest of Oklahoma City. Been here about three years. Was a missionary for several years uh, down in the Caribbean. Uh, a tough very tough place to work. Um, but we chose to move to Oklahoma just to kind of settle our family and, um, get back a little bit closer actually to our family. I got a lot of family here originally from Minnesota. Um, but we've all strangely just oddly sort of migrated down. We, we went to university in Oklahoma city, me and my four sisters, we all kind of went to the same spot and have just kind of migrated and moved down this way. Now, again, I moved away for a long time, but um, wanted to be back in Oklahoma. So I'm a, a preacher by trade. I've studied, um, I've studied other subjects. I changed my major uh, in college 400 times before settling on a degree that I did not end up using and uh, ultimately ended up studying theology. And um, yeah, I got a passion for ministering to the lost. Got a beautiful wife at home. Miranda, uh, three children, Judah, Zion, and Eden. And I feel like, and you, you guys are both fathers as well. You guys can relate. Whenever anybody asks me now what I do, it's like, I don't do anything. I go home to three kids and that's the extent of my life. That's the hobbies. <laughs> yeah. Got, are y'all with me on that? Oh yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I used to do cool stuff. I had a golf membership the first year we moved to Kingfisher. Oh, that died quickly. It's gone. <laughs> yep. It's gone. I was I was playing so much I was able to shoot in the low hundreds. Hey, <laughs> beats my two hundred. <laughs> All right, uh, Jacob. Yeah, let's, what's up, Jacob? Which, which, by the way, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a greater transition of living situations than from the Caribbean to Oklahoma. Right, right. rural <laughs> Oklahoma. Yeah, that's a hey, huge change. That shirt is beautiful. <laughs> it is. Hey, this is this is where we lived. Yeah. Oh, I know. He's that was okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'm Jacob Rutledge. I minister f uh, over in uh, the Austin area, uh, just west of Weird over in Dripping Springs, uh, Texas. I've uh, been here for seven years. Actually, uh, yesterday was our seven year mark. So I've been cool. here for a while. My wife, Jessica, and I uh, with our kiddos, uh, Natalie, uh, Easton, and Lincoln. And um, you know, kind of like what Daniel was saying, my, my hobbies are my, my kids right now. Um, and coffee. And, uh, yeah, I tried to switch to disc golf. I've done that like uh, twice. Um, but, uh, <laughs> love, love talking, uh, theology. Um, and, and I enjoy being outdoors, camping, hiking, things like that. Um, but this is really, uh, what I enjoy doing is just sitting down and, and talking about theology, doctrine, um, reading and, and, uh, getting to, to, know the Lord and know his word a little bit better. So excited about the podcast. Absolutely. Uh, all right. I'm Jack Wilkie. I'm based right now in Forney, Texas. That's uh, in the process of being changed toward uh, the Nashville area, uh, but currently uh, outside of Dallas at the Forney Church of Christ uh, and ministry here. Been here for oh, four years or so. Uh, so that makes two Texas based right now and one Oklahoman. Uh, and so uh, being the Texas guys, we're going to have to make some Oklahoma jokes. It's just part of the territory. Yeah. Um, oh, you, you, know, you know why Oklahoma's so windy? What was that? 
no, 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 no. There, we, we can go the other direction with that too. <laughs> right, well, let's not be too mean here. Um, <laughs> um, well, okay. My in-laws are up in Oklahoma. I can't be too mean to Oklahoma. Um, but yeah, so Forney Church of Christ have been preaching uh, here for some time now. And then uh, Focus Press is really my main work. And that's what I'm moving to do is plug in more to that uh, writing, podcasting, things that we're doing like this. Um, and so, yeah, uh, just with these guys, we, uh, I think... Well, let's talk about why we have this show. We've had a group text going for quite a while now, and and just things come up in the news, things come up in the church, things we read online, and we kick it back and forth. And these these great discussions of man, we need people to understand this. These are these truths that are out there that people are missing, and and the church needs to do a better job of this, that, or the other thing. Or let man, people just don't get how good God is, and it. All of those discussions and and one, I think it was maybe Daniel was the first to say, why isn't this a podcast? And so now it is a podcast. Uh, we're going to get into the need and, and really what the purpose, the the thrust of this podcast is, why we, uh, how we're going to try and be different, what we want to cover. But uh, I got to know, uh, wh- who let the dogma out? It's a great name. Why? Where? What's the origin here? Oh, it was, it was very, it happened in ve- some very deep theological ponderings. Um, actually it happened. So here's what happened. I was, I had COVID and I was, I was defined. I was sitting in a room completely by myself for like five days, my wife and three kids. I, so we, we were really taking the quarantine thing seriously because we got a little baby that went through some hard times. So we did not want me to be close to her, but there was a glass window and I could see through. So like I would hang out on one side of the window and they were on the other side and we were having dinner one night and I was sitting on my side and I was saying, Hey hon, you know, we're kind of tossing around the idea of this podcast. And I said, here's some suggestions I have. And mine were a little more serious. And she decided to ask my kids what they thought the name of the podcast should be. Well, two boys, I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old and their favorite song is who let the dogs out. And we'll, we'll play that song. They'll dance around the kitchen. So that, that song was actually playing. And when she turned to my youngest, Zion, and said, hey, you know, what should we name this thing? He said, who let the dogs out? <laughs> and, you know, you don't even think about it. You're just like, oh, that's hilarious. And you just move on. And then I was sitting there, and I was thinking of doctrine. I was thinking of theology. And I was actually looking up on Google was like synonyms for uh <laughs> for theology or dog i can't can't even remember exactly which one it was and one of the synonyms was dogma and then it's like who let the dogma out <laughs> that's it we have zion to think yeah we have zion we have our, my two-year-olds to thank and then um and I, I didn't even when i sent it to you guys originally i didn't even take it seriously and you guys laughed and then it's like no we need to do this yeah, yeah. It it just works because we were talking dogma, doctrines, all those things. And yeah. I think one of the other things is I, I just pulled up the definition because I wanted to get it right. Dogma, a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as inc- incontrovertibly true. Um, we use the word dogmatic as a bad thing, right? right. Like as a culture, oh, I don't want to be dogmatic about it. Like, well, we need to be dogmatic about certain things. And, yeah. and in this time that questions truth, we need dogma. And, and so who let the dogma out? I mean, I'm a pun fan. It, it, it's, it's perfect. Uh, oh, yeah. it I'm, a huge, I'm just a huge fan of the word dogma in general, just because I think it's like, kind of like Jack was saying, it's intentionally countercultural, right? right. It, it's like it, it, it immediately sets you against the, you know, cultural norms. And yeah. I, you know, maybe it's just cause I'm kind of uh honorary at times, but I, but I kind of, kind of like that, you know, Oh, I'm with you. I I mean, it's the same thing. Like our culture is redefining terms all the time, or they're taking terms and they're spinning them in a bad light to make it seem like the same thing happened with legalist. Like what's wrong with somebody that cares about what God's law has to say? I mean, shouldn't we? Mm. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. And, but you take that term and you all of a sudden say, oh, that's a person that just cares about law and order and doing things God's way. And you spin it as though they're, you know, as though it has to be pharisaical or conservative. Right. I mean, conservative is is the other one. Like 
whenever I've tried to maybe describe people who have disagree- disagreements with me, I don't simply refer to them as conservative because I'm conservative, you know, and I'm highly conservative. And um, so I think that, yeah, how we use that language um, matters. And uh, and maybe we should just be careful about using some of those terminology because there's just so much nuance and there's so much baggage that some of that comes with but at the same time you want to take those terms you want to redefine them you want to put them back in their proper place even with the baggage and say okay yeah i'm going to lean into this a little bit because this because i i think when people think of dogmatic they really are in some ways hitting at what it's about which is what was right. it, you know it, it, it's uncompromising right it's it's absolute it's you're a fun not, i'm not going to yield on this yeah i think one of the things we we see so often is the nuanced death of a thousand qualifiers, Christianity. I'm not saying this and I'm not saying that. And I don't want to f- offend so-and-so and, and well, l- don't get the wrong idea. Cause it's not this. We live in a time where more than anything, you need that prophetic tone. Right. Not that we're saying pro or prophets that, Oh, well, there I go with the qualifiers uh, <laughs> off the top, but that, that thus saith the Lord, right? <laughs> this is what God says. Get over it. This is how it is. I'm not yeah. going to move. And man, uh, preachers and, and articles and all this stuff that you see, well, not this. And I, I don't want to think that. And I, I saw a thing uh, with Vody Bauckham talking about uh, homosexuality, you know, a preacher getting up and saying, you know, I've got gay friends and I, I don't want anyone to think that we hate anybody. And I don't want to, you know, and all this. And he said, let's try that again. I've got friends that commit adultery. I don't want us to think that anybody, you know, like yeah. we don't do these things, but we're so, mm. uh, that's what I'm getting at is we care so much about what people think, right? We got to start caring about what God thinks. And when we do that, there is a dogma to it. There is a, th- this can't be moved. This is true. This is how it is. And so th- that's one of the things in this season that we're going to look at from a, a bunch of different angles is doctrines, yeah. why they matter and how they apply to life and why we can't back off of them. Why we can't just, because the easiest thing is not, I, I think there's a lot of preachers who aren't drawn to false teaching. They are drawn to not hitting true teaching. Yeah, they can't, you, they, can't, they can't share with Paul and saying, I declared to you the whole council. Right. They may have declared every, you know, all the council they declared may have been true, but it may not have been the whole council. And I mean, Jack, you're, you're hitting on something that I think is so important about <clears throat> this having to be nuanced, having to be, you know, perfectly articulated, having to have an argument that a pagan, godless, demonic world would find or see as plausible, or at least trying to make that attempt. And like the extent of how ridiculous or absurd that is. The other day I was watching this guy that I know that's, that's a a preacher. He was, he posted something about gender or no it was something about marriage well anyways in the thread you know those threads get off course really quick somebody was talking about gender and they were talking about you know there's biology is uh does not determine gender gender is a fluid thing and you know anyways it was all this stuff and um this preacher was like the way that he was responding was trying to make it seem like that other guy had a case that was being made. Oh, I see Mm -hmm. where you're coming from, but here's why I think this. And I just jumped in and I said, I can't even remember what I said, but it was just some very like plain blunt statement. Like, no, this is, this is absolutely untrue. Men have an X and a Y chromosome. That's, that's all there is to it. And then the guy who had been like supporting the, uh, you know, this um, gender fluidity, he commented back and he just said, I don't experience you as kind. It's just like, well, <laughs> rejoice and be glad. Yeah. The, the tone police, it's always the tone police, right? I, well, I don't like the way you said that. So what you said doesn't matter. We don't have to take it into account. It, it, it really is ridiculous. So as we said, the tagline at the top is why, where doctrine has dominion over all of life. And um, we might have somebody jump in. Well, no, Jesus has dominion over all of life. Yes. And this is how he's shown us to live it out is the doctrines he's given us is things like that. A man is a man, a woman is a woman. And uh, all of this cultural confusion about truth. And so when we talk about why doctrine matters, I think the first thing we need to explain is what doctrine is, because that goes back to that thing of we've had a very small definition of it. 
And so we can say, oh, we're teaching it. We're not teaching false doctrine. And that's good. But as you said, the whole council. And so when we say doctrine, what do you guys mean by that? Uh, let's get everyone kind of on the same page here for the listeners. What we mean when we're talking about doctrine, when we say that this podcast is about where doctrine has dominion over all of life. Well, I think, you know, at its most basic level, doctrine means teaching. But one of the things that um, that that really is different about the teaching of Scripture is, is that it means it's meant to be comprehensive, right? It, it's meant to impact all of life. And so you have, for example, you know, in First Timothy uh, chapter one, where Paul is warning Timothy, you know, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And then he goes on to talk about, listen, the reason that we're charging this, the reason that we're telling you this is so that love might issue from a pure heart, right? So he's talking about there's direct implications from the teaching into your life. And then you have passages like Colossians 3.17, 1 Corinthians 10.31 that talk about this, whatever you do, whether you're eating or whether you're drinking, do all to the glory of God. Um uh, do all in the name of Christ. So it's this idea of a comprehensive body of teaching that instructs and equips and perfects us into the image of Christ for the glory of God. And if you view it from that perspective, there's really no area of life that scripture doesn't have some impact on and some influence over. And, um, you know, the teaching the teaching of Christ is the bridge by which we connect to Christ. Um, and, and I think that's probably a key foundational um, element of our belief is that whenever we talk about experiential Christianity, um, we're, we're meaning in, in this, there is no experience with Christ apart from the word. Um, there is no experience and fellowship and relationship and communion with Christ uh, apart from his teaching. Uh, the, the Bible knows nothing of wow. genuine communion with God that is in rebellion to or apart from his teaching. If you want to come closer to God, if you want to have a greater relationship with God, then doctrine has to play a part in it because that's the bridge, the truth by which he has revealed himself to us as, as his people. So, yeah. I, I think you're right, Jacob. The, there was a, uh... One theologian um, said that you ought to be able to prick a Christian anywhere and they should bleed theology. So our, our theology, what we've typically done with it is we've said that it is confined, the extent of it is, is confined to the four walls of a church building. And not only that, but what we do for like two hours a week. Doctrine is the way we conduct our worship. Doctrine is the structure of the church government. Doctrine is the, you know, uh, the entry point to salvation. And um, doctrine is uh, the partaking of communion. And we've just rendered it down to, to that, right? Like, and no, <clears throat> Paul told Timothy that the scriptures are able to make us wise to salvation he said, so be acquainted with them. But he went on to say that they have something to say about everything so that the man of God would be equipped for every good work. And I think that right now we're witnessing Christians that, that really do not know how to live out their theology. They're, they're being faced with complex questions um, that you know, are, are really basic. I mean, if you look like, like biology, <laughs> you know, that shouldn't really be it. But it, it seems complex because it's being presented presented by you know college professors who who've done their phds in gender studies whatever that is um but but they're you know they're being faced with complex issues if you want to put it that way and they don't really know what they're supposed to be doing they don't really know what the christian stance is and you know we've talked in our group this kind of goes back to theological minimalism right yeah like we we, we rendered and this was what the ecumenical movement was built on was, all right, guys, we all disagree and we all disagree on a ton of stuff that we would, that we would individually say is very important, but what are the bare essentials that we can all agree on? 
And then born out of that was the big evangelical movement that is just is built on those basic principles and those basic principles only. And so I'll give you a prime example of what this kind of roots, what, what comes out in it. The other day, somebody came up to me. So I had, I was doing a, I was officiating a wedding. Um, and this guy came up to me, well, I didn't know him, but he recognized me because he'd come to church uh, where I preached before. And he said, you know, it had been a while, it'd been several months, but he said, I still remember your lesson because you, you know, plainly said that transgenderism and homosexuality is, is a sin. And he said, I have not heard a single minister in the churches where I attend make that statement. No. I was shocked. I was like, that's like, that shouldn't even be controversial. <laughs> Up no. until 10 years ago, that was totally accepted. But so again, doctrine matters because we're seeing a completely unhinged generation because we do not have a proper and solid theology undergirding us. The other well, thing on that of, you know, you're saying church is not dealing with that. Lewis, I, I quote Lewis a lot. You got everyone loves C.S. Lewis, right? He's got this great quote in, in screw tape letters, you know, about the demon teaching the younger demon how to tempt humans. And he said, the best thing that we can do, or like one of the, the best ways to distract humans from the work they should be doing, get them to focus on the things that don't really affect them right now. He said, uh, when there's a flood, have everybody running around with fire extinguishers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have uh, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of that going on right now with this minimalism thing of like, we're not going to address the sins that are tempting people right now. We're not going to address, you know, we're going to give you room on those. We don't want to be dogmatic again about those kinds of things. So we're going to go hit really hard this kind of thing that nobody's tempted by. Yeah. And you see something like toxic masculinity. We live in a culture where masculinity doesn't exist. Like there, we right. don't know what a man is. We don't know what manliness is. We don't know what it means to be a Christian man of God and to lead your house and, and all the things about it. And yet you've got all these people going, well, we, we got to worry about toxic masculinity. Like, that's not the problem we need to worry about. But uh, it's very easy to attack this boogeyman that we uh, we set up. Well, the point of this podcast is to attack the things where the battle is really happening. Uh, because if, if you can't fight on the front lines, if you can't fight a, and, and take a stand where the world is pushing in hardest. Right. You're going to end up with that minimalism where you just keep getting backed up, keep getting backed up, keep backing off because you're afraid of man. You, you're, you're worried about what man thinks. And so it leads to less doctrine, less ruler of rulership of Christ, less dominion of, of his word over or over our lives. Um, yeah. One of the things I want to say about this and, and get your guys comments on it. There are some Christians. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to get to this of who this podcast is for. This is for all Christians. Uh, we want it to be for preachers. We want to help preachers explain these things to their congregations. We want it to be for elders so they're equipped for these battles. But we want it to be for Christians as well, because I think one of the things that happens is when you say the word theology, when you say some of these isms and ologies and, and some of these ideas that we're going to be talking about, I think some people's eyes glaze over. They go, that's academic. That doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Um, that's not the case at all. This stuff all applies to you. And that's the point that we want to make. Mm -hmm. is this isn't just for eggheads in academia. This isn't just for guys in the pulpit. Doctrine is for everybody. And if you don't think you believe doctrine, you you do. One way or another, you're believing a doctrine, eh, whether you realize it or not. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and I, and I think that the, the lack of clarity, the lack of articulation, um, from the pulpit to the pew. And I've thought about this before. I've, I've seen a huge de-emphasis on the importance of like public teaching, but I think that we forget the power of people coming together and assuming and believing that they have a common bond and buying into whatever is the authorized teaching that's coming from the pulpit. And so that forms, it either challenges, it confirms, it critiques, whatever it is, the worldview and perspective of the people within the pew. So there's this direct and intimate connection between the minister and between the people as he tries to display the glory of God within the word. But at the same time, um, 
when there's a when there's a lack of that of, of proper doctrine, uh, the church suffers, and and yet you have members that might hunger for that and still long for that. You know, that hopefully will benefit from this podcast as well. That maybe maybe they're not getting that from their pulpit. Maybe they're not getting that from where they're worshiping. Um, and they're hungering that some of these issues might be talked about and, and give some articulation to that. That that's what we're hoping to do in this podcast. I'll give an example. We're all turning to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that's, oh, right. That's, that's right. And, and you have these Peterson. cultural voices that are speaking these important truths, which are pretty common sense, right? I mean, it's not some new revelation, but it seems so startling because we have this um, just cultural hesitancy to even discuss absolute truths. And that's go back to what you were saying earlier, Daniel, which, which I do think gives the church a unique opportunity to fill that void. The problem is, is that I think we're far too hesitant to fill that void. But I want to give an example of what I was saying a minute ago, because I had a minister friend of mine who was telling me how, you know, he recently recently spoke on a, a summer youth series somewhere. And he talked about a lot of the things that we're talking about, about how the church is at war with culture and and the and the the worldview and the perspective that we are offering is going to just inherently be combative to the the worldview that the world is trying to push. And, you know, he talked about homosexuality. He talked about transgenderism. He talked about all of these things that are corrupting um, our present society. And he had a young 15 year old girl come up to him afterwards and told him like, listen, thank you for talking about this because we never hear this at our church and we never hear it at any of the churches around here whenever right. we go to it. And she said when she went to go already, when she went to go sit down at the meal afterwards with her youth group, there were already people in her youth group saying, well, why did he talk about those types of things? That That's offensive to those crowds. You know, that that's insensitive. And it was mainly, I told you guys, it was mainly the young men that were saying these things, which is even more alarming to me. Um, and so it's, it's um, I think that there is, Number one, there's a crowd that's hungering for more substantive teaching that engages combative, combatively. I, I don't I don't mind using that language of combat because Paul does in First Corinthians chapter ten, three through five, right? Um, I remember <laughs> I remember one guy saying, uh, you know, the Lord never commanded us to uh, to uh, what did he say to win arguments? The Lord never commanded us to win arguments. I'm like, yeah, he did. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that we're supposed to take down every lofty opinion and argument that exalts itself against God. So um, I want to win arguments. You know, yeah. I, I don't I want to do it in a Christ like way. Yeah. But um, people need to know. And, I, and I've told our, our congregation here, we're going through a class on Wednesday nights about confronting some of these difficult questions that the culture gives to Christianity and how we engage with that. And one of the things I've been pushing them to do, I said, listen. When it comes to these hard conversations, don't always be on the defense. Right. Be on the offense. Play offense. Like if you're constantly on your heels in these conversations, you need to find a way to turn it around because the Christian ethic and the Christian belief system and Christian doctrine is superior. And I'm unapologetically going to say that, that it is the better worldview, the best worldview, the best teaching of life because it's true. And if yeah. you actually believe that, you should have immense confidence when you're going into conversations, even if you might not articulate it exactly how you think you should every time, put those people, put them on the defense. Say, well, let me ask you this. What about this? You know, wh yeah. wh what about this area? We don't believe, we don't believe that Christians that, you know, when Paul said to take up the full armor of God, he meant only a shield, not the sword part. I, there's this weird thing that, so or it's only yeah. internal, right? It's only internal. Right. I think that's how well, people right. It's just in the church. Right. But Jack, you've talked about um, kind of this weird romantic. So there's, I've been thinking about this strange positioning that's actually in conflict, but it's the same people that are doing it. One of them is, <clears throat> Jack, you've talked about um, how we romanticize martyrdom. And it's the idea that the only way that the church is going to grow is if, you know, if we have some pagan government and a pagan power and, you know, um, they're really heavily persecuting us and that's going to cause us to be, you know, forged in fire. And then we're going to all of a sudden be the strongest church. And, you know, we've, we've talked about, well, look at China, look at, 
North Korea. Um, Christianity obviously is not spreading over there like it is in Africa where they're free to do it. So that, that case, I don't think can really be made. But the other thing is, and it's, <clears throat> it's on the flip side, is we romanticize martyr, a martyrdom that doesn't exist here. And we say, you know, we're going to be the best, strongest church when we are being martyred. But it's the same people that will not, under any circumstances, be hated. They, they mm. hate the idea of being hated. They, they, this is that, that Tim Keller winsome approach of, it, you know, we have to be always, we have to be seen as the nice guys. And so it, it's interesting we're completely unwilling in the current circumstances where we have peace. We're completely unwilling to engage in any kind of um, debate or discussion that would bring <laughs> that would bring hostility or uh, criticism our way. And yet we romanticize martyrdom. So it really and truly, um, if martyrdom ever does come, those people that will not engage in any difficult subjects now. They're just, they're going to double down on not engaging in it. I had a preacher tell me in a Facebook discussion, he said, uh, is, uh, man, it's been a while, but it was essentially, you're doing something wrong if people hate you. Yeah. You know, Christians, if you're hated by the world and it's like, oh, say that to Jesus, you read Jesus, uh, number one, they killed Jesus. But number two, woe to you when all men speak well of you bless are you when people persecute you speak evil against you falsely because of mine uh, the world is going to hate you because they hate it. like how many of those do we have to cite but it really is this thing of like whoa 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 they're mad at us and uh, people who listen to, to my other podcast think deeper have probably heard me get into john six i, I drive back to john six all the time because i think it's one of the most pertinent mm -hmm. chapters, one of the most pertinent uh, instances of all of Jesus' teaching for today's world. Jesus had the crowd. He had the numbers. We love the numbers. We always want more numbers. What did Jesus do with the numbers? You're not here for the right reasons. Go home. Mm -hmm. and, and boy, that mindset, it just, people couldn't handle. Uh, like you said, mm -hmm. we don't want to be hated. We don't want anybody to be mad at us. And Jesus is literally running away from them. And then when we finally catch up to him, he's like, you're just here for the free bread. Yeah. Well, what we're dealing case. with and, and what Jacob was talking about of you've got people who are hungering. And you remember what Peter says at the end of that chapter, where else are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. Yeah. What we're doing is saying, we're not going to feed those people bread we're going to feed the people who are here for the wrong reasons. We're going to just keep giving it to them. We're going to lower this, you know, lowest common denominator, theological minimalism, as, as you said, Daniel, to keep yeah. people happy. But then the people who want to be holier are starving to death. The, the people Jacob is talking about. And anytime I've preached on a controversial subject where I'm like, man, people are going to be mad. I'm going to have to deal with the fallout of this. The people, you know, the, the, the strongest Christians go, man, thank you for talking about that. And, and a couple of them even like, man, that stepped on my toes, but that was what I needed to hear. Holy people want that. And we're, it's just crazy that we're catering to the unholy, the people that don't care to try and get the numbers. Right. And I, and I think that's true too. Like, it's not just a fear of being hated by the world. It's, it's a fear of being hated by the church as it is. Right. So there's this hesitancy to engage in some of these topics, because I, I think that probably some of the things that we're going to talk about on this podcast over time are going to chip away at some of the sacred cows that we are saying, well, okay, either maybe that's not, shouldn't be as elevated as it is, or maybe we're looking at this from the wrong perspective or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, I think some of that fear comes from like, not just the world. I can deal with the hate from the world, but hate from the church, you know, hate, hate from those who claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, cause that's a very real thing too. Like you, you, it's, it's one thing to be hated by people that I'm probably not ever going to engage with that much, you know, um, even if they live in my own community, you know, uh -huh. it's another thing to be hated by the very people that you're trying to help. And I think that yeah. that's a fear for some guys is like, man, if I speak out, if I can't just kind of speak my mind on these things, there's going to be oh, yeah. some pushback. From well, how many, how, how many churches are, are actually like one, one of those that I think speaks directly to what you're talking about, maybe we'll have an episode on this is marriage. 
Like we've lowered the bar so much on marriage that there's a reason why we've just fully embraced, you know, what, what Wilson calls gay mirage. There, there's a reason why is because gay mirage. We, for, 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 a, for how long have we like not taught about biblical marriage, which is, I mean, I asked my five-year-old what's marriage and my two-year-old and they both know one man and one woman for life. But we've had such... That's exactly what I say to my kids. They say the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a great question to kind of get them thinking about this because we've got so many um, in our churches that have been married and divorced and and how many are not willing to preach what Jesus said in Matthew 5 or Matthew 19 about the nature of marriage and divorce and remarriage. Yep. And, you know, it's a fear It's a fear of of being hated. But I think it goes back to... Jack, you mentioned, you know, all the things Jesus says about we're going to be hated, right? I mean, this is a promise, but God is looking for a good soil. And so Jesus doesn't, Jesus is going to sift the wheat from the chaff up front, which is why you can have somebody come to him saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus says, well, you're, you really don't want to because the son of man doesn't even have a place to sleep. Or the other man, hey, Jesus, I'm going to come follow you, but first let me bury my father. And Jesus just says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Or when the rich man came to Jesus, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. I've done all this stuff. What's, what do I need to do? And Jesus gave him literally the hardest thing you could possibly ever do. And then, you know, go sell everything you have. But Jesus said the same thing to his disciples. After Peter confessed him as Christ in Matthew 16, he said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and pick up your cross. So Jesus, he, he set that from the start saying, we're, yeah. we're not gaining disciples by having bit, you know, a flooded audience of people that really don't care about my words and are going to contribute to the plate. God doesn't care about that. God wants people that are sitting in the pews that actually love him, that actually want to follow him, and that are willing to embrace a self-denial that's going to hurt. And that's going to demand that the world. And that type of growth, there is a growth that comes from God, right? Paul talks about that in yeah. First Corinthians, was First Corinthians three. There's a growth that comes from God, but and I think this is something we'll talk about later. That growth is much more steady. It's it's over time rather than you know quick flashes. I want right. to come back to that marriage and divorce thing because I think that's a great example of how <clears throat> we have bought into this idea that doctrine only impacts what we do on Sunday and in a very limited scope. Because, you know, I'm sure that you guys have had those conversations with people. We, I mean, we've had people leave our congregation uh, over my teaching on marriage and divorce. And, um, you know, we, we've, ha- we've had these people who say, well, are, you, you can't really believe that, like, if they're in a situation where they they shouldn't be in a, in a, in a particular marriage or are called to be celibate for the rest of their life, you know, they're like, well, you can't really believe that Jesus expects me to not have sex. For the rest of my life, essentially is how they put it. And it's like, well, uh, he expected himself to not have sex. So, I mean, Jesus never had sex and he was killed. And the whole idea is going back to you were talking about those individuals who um, who kind of claim, you know, that they're ready for martyrdom and yet they won't be hated right now. You have the same thing in the church where people are like, listen, I'll sacrifice anything for Jesus. I'll do anything for Christ. I'll, you know, whatever I need to do. Okay, well, sacrifice your spouse. Yeah, right. Whoever you loves know, father, mother, brother more than me. Sacrifice your marriage. You know, and the, and the, right, those passages, I, and I'm not saying that's easy, right. but I'm saying that the theology and the doctrine um, substantiating that. I mean, I, I appreciate more the people who say, you know what? I know that that's what Christ requires of me. Mm-hmm. Um, I get that. I understand that, but I'm not willing to make that sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, I respect those people more who are honest Right. And at least recognize that I can't, if I want to be pleasing to God, I can, and I have, I'm sure you've had people like that who are just honest and are like, listen, I, you know, I know that's what God requires of me, but I'm not willing to pay the price. Like, well, Hey, you know, <laughs> God's going to give you that right. I mean, this is condemnation, but you yeah. can enjoy a few years of pleasure right now. But at the end of the day, at least you recognize that those two things are incompatible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, he did not have a problem just telling us the hard stuff up front to deter us from following him. 
There was no problem there. I mean, that's, that's exactly in Matthew 19. You talk about the person who say, you, you can't say Jesus would expect for me to live a celibate life, you know, because I'm, I'm living in an unscriptural marriage. Well, no, actually you can, because Jesus literally said some people for the sake of the kingdom of heaven have eunuchs. made themselves eunuchs. Yeah. Right. And Jesus also said, you know, I've, I've, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. And mm -hmm. it's a sword that will divide mother from father. And it's a sword that's going to separate families. And he even said, you, you will have to leave families and lands and, you know, occupations and all kinds of things for my name's sake. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, we think that God's chief concern are the daily affairs of his creation. And that's God's chief concern is, has, has been planned since eternity past. And it concerns his love for that, which he created and his redeeming of them. Yes. It's and life ordered it, after it, his will. Right. And if any of the things that we're involved in are a threat to that, God will say, you must sacrifice, you must put it away, no, no matter what that means for your personal life. And all of that's connected. Right? All of this is what we're talking about is connected of what's happening in the culture, what's happening in the church, what's happening in the home is all interconnected because, you know, or, or you see these churches that are progressively um, being more accepting of, of homosexuality and other perverse things. And you're like, well, how does that happen? How, how does that, how do you get to a point as a church where you're more open to this type of thing? I can guarantee you it's happening at churches that really never took God's teaching on marriage and divorce seriously to begin with. Because one of the things that I will tell people who struggle with the teaching of Christ on marriage is, okay, but you would admit that if a homosexual couple came in here, maybe, maybe a homosexual couple, they've been together for 20 years. They have three or four kids that they've adopted. They're a, a strong, tight-knit family. Um, what would you say that that couple has to do to be right in the sight of God? Mm -hmm. You know, what would you say in that instance? You would, you would say that they had to get out of that relationship. You yeah. know, we would do as a church what we can to help them, right. but that's not pleasing, even though there's severe consequences to right. that emotionally, right. relationally, financially. We would say, listen, you've got to get out of that. Flip it around though, and turn it to someone that's in a. I'm not trying to get make this MDR discussion. I just feel like this an an, an appropriate yeah it is application yeah. of this where it's like, but then all of a sudden when it when it's heterosexual, we say no, no, that's okay, you know. Yeah. But the problem is, is that the world sees that inconsistency. Right. If you have some, look at the comments on some of these discussions, like on social media. If you have people who are commenting who are raised in the church and then left the church and are now approving of homosexual marriage, one of the top things they will say is, yeah, they'll talk about homosexuality all, so homosexuality all day long, but they're not about to talk about that deacon that's in an adulterous marriage. Right. Right. So yeah. they see that inconsistency and they see how Christians really don't apply some of these things to the whole aspect of human life. Right. Right. And, and that's why, that. that's why doctrine matters. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, cause you think about how many doctrines, how many doctrines are undergirding this discussion, your Christology, Jesus, it, we will get into this in this season, the lion and the lamb thing. Well, Jesus is just a lamb. Jesus, stopped. he loved everybody. He's nice to everybody. He, you know, it, the, the classic example everyone always wants to go to is Jesus flipped tables and it's that, but he also said things like you might have to be a eunuch for the gospel. Jesus was hard lined on these things. He was dogmatic. Right. But our Christology today is this soft lamb, wimp, really wimpy Jesus is, is what I call it. Yeah. I, mean, oh, I saw the loser, a thing the, the other loser day. Lord. Uh, yeah. the, the lady that wrote the book, Jesus and John Wayne, uh, which is Dude. real popular among uh, progressive elements uh, about Christian cultural engagement. But she literally tweeted and said, you know, these people that that are on this side of things, these these conservative people, their Jesus looks nothing like Mr. Rogers. Like, oh, I don't yeah. want to look like Mr. Rogers. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Can you imagine Jesus sitting there? Woe is you for you uh, blind guides. You both fall into a pit with his, his cardigan on like. 
It's not compatible. He's not Mr. Mm-hmm. Rogers. But yeah, when you get a Christology that says he's Mr. Rogers, then you can say he wouldn't tell me what to do with my marriage. He yeah. wouldn't tell me what to do with my sex life. He wouldn't tell right. me what to do with my kids, my money, my anything else. And now you're just open to that. And so your Christ of course, of course, wasn't uh, Mr. Rogers like a conservative Christian as well. So it's like even their perception of him is probably <laughs> right. <laughs> probably. Off. I mean, yeah, they're looking at like this like this hour window where he was like catering to four-year-olds that's, <laughs> but that's it you, like, you know, we talked about lowest common denominator denominator yeah. christianity that's what you're doing is putting it on a level of a little kid basic soft talking to you you know like you eh, just missing the whole point of, of who jesus is and so when people come around with that of oh doctrine i don't really care about that that's over my head it's not it you have a doctrine and right. if you operate yes. as if jesus is mr rogers that's a Christology, and it's a wrong Christology. So yeah, you better get shaped, a right who one. Shaped, yeah, who shaped that? Because that, yeah. we're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do an episode later in the season about you know picking the wrong priests, and you know we'll have a whole episode on this. But you know, who is it that's that's designating and defining who Jesus is? People are not getting their picture of Jesus from the Bible. They're these, th- those that are say those that are comparing Jesus to Mr. Rogers have not been reading the gospels. Mm-hmm. They they'll read any other book. They'll watch a TikTok, but they will not read the Bible. And that's mm-hmm. why doctrine matters. And so, it, I mean, everything we're going to be doing in this show is going to be going back to hopefully being going back to and being able to be proven simply by the scriptures that we bring out to say that, look, we're not we're not basing these things on how we feel about it or how we would, you know, what would be most, most convenient for us to take a standing on. We're going to base it in the words of life that, you know, Peter went back to and those words that make us wise unto salvation, at least in principle. Now I do want to put a caveat on that because I do think that there, there's, there are some that, they need like almost an express book chapter verse to be able to draw inferences, to be able to draw just natural, um, the natural implication of something. And, um, I think we also need to have a doctrine and a theology that's completely consistent with the Bible, but that goes in the direction that the Bible is pointing, even if there's not, you know what I'm saying? Even if, yeah, like some of the Romans 13 stuff concerning government and what that's going to ultimately look like. It, it doesn't have to give us an exact guide. It gives us principles and then we go off of those principles and then they form our direction and our thoughts. And well, I want to go back to the, to the um, real quickly to this idea of like how we view Christ. Right. Because that's, that's what's so funny to me is like this, this lack of emphasis on doctrine. And then, well, we just, you know, we just, if we would just focus on Christ, it's like, Number one, why do you know anything about Jesus in the first place? The only reason you know anything about Jesus is because there was a formative body of teaching that had been passed down from previous generations, a particular tradition by which um, Paul would say already in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, he was worried that the Corinthians would believe in a different Jesus. Right. So I don't necessarily now he could be talking about false prophets there, but I tend to think he's saying that they're they're going to begin believing the wrong strain of teaching about Christ. And what you believe about Jesus is going to directly impact everything else. And one of the things that I've told the church here is that, listen, if you're never challenged um, by your view of Christ, if, if you never once feel uncomfortable when you're reading through the Gospels or. God never makes you uncomfortable. You're never challenged. You're never kind of kind of reco- recoil, right? You kind of naturally recoil at some of these things. Then you probably don't have the right picture of God. Then you d- probably don't, because the natural man in, in our sin and our selfishness, mm-hmm. what is it going to do whenever it's faced with the holiness of God and so the well, holiness of Christ? We're going to do an episode on Marcionism, which was, you know, Marcy and the heretic, said we need to cut out the old testament the old testament god is a different god than the new testament god that's one of these doctrines your christology is well boy god killed a lot of people in the new testament but it's different now the jesus jesus isn't mean like that and what that leads to is people like andy stanley getting up and telling people 
we got to unhitch from the Old Testament. The the world doesn't like the mean God of the Old Testament. So let's stop talking about him and just focus on Jesus. Like, it's like guess who did time. that? Guess who was the one behind the flood? Guess who? Jesus was there. He was part of that. And and if you don't believe that, go read Revelation. Uh, where say, you bet, you're going to have a hard time with Revelation then. Flame oh. and sword and death and family like it, man he he drops the hammer and so yeah, really. uh, there's so many of our episodes this season are going to touch on this kind of thing of the jesus you believe the doctrines that you've accepted and and how they play out in your life whether you realize it or not yeah and some of this i feel like i'm kind of kind of uh, almost chastening my own past self because there, there was a time where i was leaning into some of this like just kind of focusing on the central things and not really you know, a, you know, and, and and we're not saying that there aren't areas of disagreement where we are still in fellowship with people. I don't think any of us would, would say that, but what we are saying is that you can't, you can't say that, okay, this area of my life is for me. And this area of my life is for the Lord, right? Like I'll let this be dictated by Christ and his teaching, but you better not tell me that how I conduct myself at school the activities that I choose to participate in at work, uh, the things I do with my friends um, outside of church, you know, you better not say that those things are impacted by Christ um, because then, then that's when you get into to trouble. And going back to this idea of the Old Testament, Christ, um, I feel like I'm jumping around a lot, but like I was talking to you guys the other day in the text message, like if you view, which I do, if you view Jerusalem as kind of, God's vindicative act um, for the glory of his name against the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And, and I think in Matthew 24 and other passages, Jesus says that that was kind of the authenticating act of his enthronement upon the throne of David, right? Like it, it, it was his final declaration um, right. that he was enthroned. What you have there is the, the, the validating confir confirmation of Christ reigning was the killing of a million people. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a second, because that's how many people were killed in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And brutally and so. I mean, and just Jesus brutally. It is, wasn't yes, a, a nuclear bomb where it's over in a minute. I mean, it like was... Like 500 crucifixions every day. Yeah. I mean, literally, they said blood was running down the steps of the, the temple. Right. And, and like, my point is not, well, we should go out and kill people. That's not the point. The point is, is that... The, the, the message of Christ the, is that the Father has given both salvation and judgment into his hand. Mm -hmm. And that over and over again, Jesus was talking about the judgment that was coming upon Jerusalem if they didn't repent. Obviously, that's not what he wanted. I mean, his whole life was given so that they did not have to endure that, right? You want to take you under my wing, you know, like a mother. Right. I, I want to I coddle you, right? I want yeah. to I want to care for you. I want to I want to love you. Yeah. Um, but, and what, what is it, you know, so, but, but when he's enthroned, that yeah. vengeance is poured out on Jerusalem. And that is, that yeah. is, this, that's like, is that really your picture of Jesus? This God who, this enthroned Lord who is pouring out vengeance upon this nation, <laughs> um, you know, but that's a picture of the, the final return of Christ. Right. Um, right. and even, even, even presently his, his ruling of, of the nations, you know, and it's like, that's why I think that we struggle whenever things happen to our nation, we struggle to say, oh, that was an act of judgment of God against our nation. Right. right. Why do we struggle? Like after 9-11, there were people saying that and they were quickly, you know, attacked for it. You know, right. Right. Um, yeah. Is there a disaster that comes upon a city that I did not cause? Which right. Prophet? It, which, which prophet? It was yeah. one of the major. But yeah, I mean. Jacob, the same principle that you see in Matthew 24, because, you know, I mean, I, I think our reaction is to immediately think that Christians are saying that Christians are going to go out and be um, violent in this way. No, right. no. We're, we're called to bring the gospel, which is going to have a different kind of, uh, it's going to be a different kind of offense. It really is going to be bringing down those demonic strongholds and those powers and those authorities that are over us. Right. But God does still have a minister of justice that really and truly is supposed to be carrying out God's justice 
with a sword. Romans 13 says that that is what the govern, governing powers are. There's no authority that exists except those which are instituted by God. And they exist for the purpose of punishing evildoers and rewarding the doers of good. And Paul says he doesn't bear the sword in vain. Yep. So, I mean, you have right at the end of Romans 12, where Paul says, look, you individual Christian, don't go pick up, don't, do not seek vengeance. Vengeance is mine. But, you know, again, this goes back to, we still have a God who, though his greatest desire is to save the world, if someone is not going to come to him, then God is going to seek vengeance on them. And he'll do it either in this life or in the next life. Yeah. And we don't, and we don't, we don't, um, hope for that i'm well um, and in some sense we do right i mean it's okay to trust in the vengeance of god second thessalonians 1 7 through 9 if you're being persecuted right at the same time like we still want them to repent just as god does right and we need we need to do an, by the way that, that's a whole nother episode we need to do an episode on just war and uh the governmental in psalms yeah <laughs> right, yeah right yeah but 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 i think all of this all of this goes back to like having this doctrine that has dominion over all of life right because um, and, and allowing true doctrine to determine that. And I would say going, connecting to what Daniel said earlier, you've got to spend time in the word of God. Now I'm all for, if you know me, I'm all for scholarship and, and allowing resources to, to aid us and help us. I, I mean, you can see my, if you're watching on the YouTube, but you can see the library behind me here. I, you know, I, I love reading. I love studying at the same time. Um, the only way you're going to truly see Christ in all of his glory is if you're in the word of God and you're allowing doctrine to inform you. And I would say you're listening to the right voices. Yeah. You know, there, there's right. a lot of, I'm going to be speaking, uh, preaching this Sunday on testing the spirits from first John chapter four, because he says many false prophets have gone out. Yeah. There's a lot of dangerous voices out there. Well, and that gets to your point you were making a, a few minutes ago about, God shocking us, God being different than what we would expect him to yes. be. God, God hurting us. I wanted to read this, this quote from Dallas Willard, who was one of the main purveyors of the wimpy Jesus thing. From what I've seen, I, I tried to read one of his books. I just, I just couldn't do it. He said, the acid test for any theology is this, is the God presented one that can be loved heart, soul, mind, and strength. If the thoughtful, honest answer is not really, then we need to look elsewhere or deeper. Basically, if, if I can't love God in the, you know, the way that he's presented, well, I must be misunderstanding, you know, like I, I need to like go restudy. No, right. God is going to be hard to love sometimes because yeah. of our weakness, not because of him. And I right. think that that is the main thing that we want to do with this podcast and why dogma doctrine, why this all matters is it's a respect for the holiness of God. And yes. that's uh, I mean, I think we, we we're all uh, familiar with Sproul's work on that where he, he says that is the biggest issue facing people today, facing people who want to be Christians today is not getting the holiness of God. And that's what we want this podcast to do is to say, he's holy. We're not. So we better do things his way and we better get those things right. Dogmatically, doctrinally, so that we can be holy as he is holy or for I want to come back. I, holy. I feel like I've been talking a lot, but I want to come back to that quote from Willard because I was listening. I was doing a lot of like deconstructive um, study for a lesson I just recently did for our college kids at our youth event we have here. And one of the things I watched was the Rhett and Link. Are you guys familiar with Rhett and Link? Um, they're big YouTubers. And so they they came from like evan right. conservative evangelical background, but now they're not. They're what they call hopeful agnostics. And of course, that's there's issues with that terminology in and of itself. But um, but they talk about their deconstructive story. And one of the like most powerful moments in there is when Rhett was like, you know, I finally asked myself the questions that I was too afraid to ask. And he said, if I didn't have to believe in a God who, you know, slaughtered, you know, men, women, and children uh, at the conquering of, of, of Canaan within Joshua, then why would I? If I don't have to believe in a God who sends, you know, a majority of people to hell, you know, then why would I? If I don't have to, so it's all of these things that he knows that the Bible teaches right. to an extent. And yet he's saying, why would I want to believe in that God? So that kind of goes against Willard's point there that if if you're, again, if you're never like kind of naturally recoil at some, like I think of like the end of, uh, is it, is it my mind's going black? I guess I think in the first Samuel 
or second Samuel. My mind's going blank. Whenever David does the census, right? Um, and, you know, God gives him a choice, like what he wants to do. And then David's like, what well, you make the choice. And then God just decides to kill tons of people because of David's census there. I don't, I mean, that startles me, you know, to me, I'm like, that is deeply challenging to me. Um, and at the same time, I also recognize that I'm probably not seeing that rightly because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not holy as God is holy. Right. And, and I think that if, if you just come to script, like there's so much wrong with that Willard quote. <laughs> I mean, Isaiah, whenever he sees the holiness of God, he hates himself. Like immediately he's like, uh, can, can, can you literally rip me limb from limb? Because I don't want to be in your presence. Yeah. Like that's what Isaiah is saying there. I want to break down at, a, uh, from, from all my atoms breaking down. Just let me be done away with because your holiness is too mm. much. Oh God. Well, there was a similar thing in, and I'll say this point and then we should wrap this episode up. But in 1947 at the world conference for Christian youth that was held in Oslo, Norway, this was during a time where they were like on the search for the historical Jesus. And really what they were doing was it was, it was, it was basically the precursor to what our deconstructionism is. And it was, but they were actually removing pages from the Bible. And they said that the, essentially, this is a paraphrase, but the litmus test for true biblical inspiration is that which carries with it um, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, what they meant by that was, if it doesn't seem like this passage carries the air of Jesus, then it isn't inspired of God. And what they did was they just, I mean, you, you would start taking out anything. And then it's just based on your perception of Jesus. Who's yeah, Jesus? Like, what does well, that even mean? Well, I say it's Jesus. Mr. Mr. Rogers. Rogers. Yeah. And therefore, he did not say, woe to you. He did not pr pronounce all those curses in Matthew 23. He, he, my Jesus wouldn't do that. And... So this podcast purpose of this is to just give a full orbed. That was for you, Jacob. Um, I have to find out why you don't like that word, but a full orbed view of uh, theology that is based in what God's revelation to us is. And we, and we won't be ashamed of any of that. We're going to double down on it. And we do believe that there's a huge audience of people that are hungering and thirsting for it. Um, so in other, in, a, in other words, to let the dogma out. Exactly. Yes, we're letting, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, they let it out. We're bringing it back yeah. in. Well, yeah. Who was it that let it out? I think it yeah. was Miley Cyrus. No, it was yeah. Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we actually, I'm, I'm just going to put you guys on the spot here. We have not planned. Uh, well, we've, we've got a bunch of episodes we're going to get to, but we didn't order them. So next week, I think we need to go to the sufficiency of scripture or the cultural priesthood, the, the, the priest that people are listening to. Which one do you guys want to do first? Uh, we'll do those as two and three. What, what's coming next week? Start with sufficiency of scripture because yeah, that, that will, that'll, that'll, that'll play into um, how, you know, set us up for how we've chosen the wrong priests. Yeah. yeah. So, sufficiency and inerrancy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in the same episode because I'll save it for that. But this is another one of those things. If people have adopted beliefs, they don't even realize that affect everything they do. And so we'll, we'll uh, make that episode two coming next week. Uh, we want to thank you guys for checking out who let the dogma out. Uh, whatever podcast feed you're getting this on, make sure you subscribe. So you get them next week. If you're watching on YouTube, like comment, subscribe, share it with your friends. This is a uh, word of mouth is how podcasts spread. And so help us get the word out. If, if you think these are conversations that need to be happening, if, if this is something that you are interested in and, and want to uh, spread the word about, please do please help us uh, show people dogma is not a bad thing. Doctrine is not a bad thing. It's something we need desperately. And so we will be back next week with episode two of Who Let the Dogma Out? Once again, where doctrine has dominion over all of life. <laughs> <laughs>